Good afternoon. Um, this talk is about the private public fund of the heritage, by which I mean largely the built heritage, um, historic, um, the museums, um, archaeological sites, certain parks, certain outstanding landscapes. Um, but actually the model applies equally well to the funding of fine arts and the performing arts. And um, it's based upon my experience as an expert advisor to something called the Heritage Lottery Fund in Britain, which affected a complete transformation of the funding culture in the United Kingdom. Um, I start off with a little saying, which is, give a starving man a fish and you take away his hunger today. But if you teach him to fish, not only will he not go hungry again, but you make him master of his own fate. I think this should be the rule in the realm that we're discussing today. I've got two propositions. Proposition one, not all public money is equal. There is money that makes people passive or even corrupt. And then there is money that stimulates them into action. Proposition two, being to proposition one, that people must be involved and given power so that they feel responsibility for the heritage. This is not just because it is cheaper that way, but because the heritage belongs to everybody and not to the authorities, and it is the people's right to have a say in the matter and to participate. Now, the key concept that has been introduced into the British funding model is that of challenge funding, in which you have to prove that you deserve to be given the money. And this revolution took place in the funding of the heritage in the United Kingdom with the creation of the Heritage Lottery Fund in 1994, with money deriving from the new National Lottery. The Heritage Lottery Fund is steered by a board of trustees. That's a peculiarly English kind of structure, um, not part of the government, but with power devolved to it to the government, and nearly always composed of unpaid volunteers, um, people of um, great honesty and usually of considerable prestige. But their appointment is approved by government, who hand out this, this fund, the Heritage Lottery Fund, is handing out, it's handing out about £315 million pounds a year. It contributes sums that range from as little as £3,000 to £5 million for a project for the expansion or refurbishment of museums, parks, historic buildings, archaeological sites, or the environment. These have to be capital projects, that is, extra to the normal expenditure. Uh, the reason for this is that it was, if they, they knew very well that if they gave it for ordinary expenditure, then the government would simply cut its ordinary funding. The Heritage Lottery Fund never funds anything 100% because this leads to passivity in the recipient and also leads to waste. In applying for a grant, the petitioner has to show um, his commitment to a project by raising at least 25% of the sum himself. The processes of the Heritage Lottery Fund, sorry, I shall be moving on. Um, The processes of the Heritage Lottery Fund have also stimulated the management revolution in the heritage sector. His first chairman was the financier and philanthropist Lord Rothschild, who knew both, knew both the cultural and the business sectors well. He had seen that the administration of many cultural organizations was less than businesslike. So he insisted that anybody applying for a grant submit a business plan. And because he knew that many of these organizations didn't know how to prepare one, he allowed the Heritage Lottery Fund to give grants for the body to employ business consultants such as KPMG to work with them and teach them how to do it. So in effect, Lord Rothschild brought about a long-lasting... Um, um, well, he, he induced the heritage organizations of the UK to undertake crash courses in management studies in their own interest. In deciding whether to make a grant or not, the Heritage Lottery Fund lays great emphasis on, first of all, the long-term impact of any project. Will it still be worthwhile in 20 or 50 years' time? 
Uh, secondly, the rigor and the transparency with which the institution competes for funding. Thirdly, the sustainability of a project in physical and financial terms. Quite simply, will it last? Will it have enough money to keep going? And fourthly, will the project help further social cohesion in the community? So now I bring you to my case history. Um, the 18th century London church of St. Martin the Veals is famous for, by the way, my slides, never mind. Uh, the 18th century church of St. Martin in the Fields, is, which is famous for an orchestra called the Academy of St. Martin in the Fields, founded by its head of music, is in Trafalgar Square in London. And it embarked on a 36 million project to restore the church, create spaces for the homeless, and a social club for the workers in nearby Chinatown. It began fundraising in 2002 and raised 21.65 million from private sources in the UK, the USA and Hong Kong, while the Heritage Lottery Fund granted it 15.35 million. The project was so well supported that when the new centre was inaugurated in April 2009, the church had only one million pounds left to raise. Now this is the church um, you may well recognize it, not just for the church itself, but because it became the model for the churches in hundreds of small communities all over the United States. Uh, this is a print showing its interior. Uh, this is a, um, an image of the kind of lift, rather splendid space age lift that was created next to it to take people down into the crypt. Uh, because the crypt is where they have now have a restaurant, so they have services in the church for um, the community, and they have them in English, they have them in Cantonese and in Mandarin. They have the concerts in the church, they have a restaurant in the crypt. The income from both the concerts and the restaurant fund the uh, looking after of the homeless and the social club for the Chinese workers in Chinatown. So you get a perfect synergy between the various functions of the church, its core mission, its religious mission, which is its religious mission, its social mission, its artistic mission, and the, the money that is left over gets spent on maintained maintenance of the church. So to sum up, every project should have its business plan. Every project should be sustainable, in other words, should last. It should reward commitment and efficiency with extra finance. People should work together. The authorities should collaborate with private bodies, trusts and individuals on an equal, not authoritarian basis. And people in authority must be transparent in how they reach their decisions and in how they spend their money. For example, the figures in this paper today were all taken off the website of the Heritage Lottery Fund. Every stage of their decision making is made public. Above all, the authorities must trust the citizen and allow him or her to take responsibility. That way, a whole army of people can be harnessed to look after the heritage at low and sometimes no cost at all and can start to turn the nation as a whole into the custodian of itself. Thank you very much.